think I'm switched on. Am I switched on? Yeah, good. Thank you. That's helpful to know. I want to speak to you about thankfulness this evening uh, from those uh, verses. So that's what we're going to be looking at. It's kind of appropriate on Harvest Sunday, uh, but we want to think much more widely than just the harvest. So we're going to be thinking about being a thankful person, a thankful Christian. Again, let's bow our heads and pray. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that we have every reason to rejoice. Lord, we confess our sins to you, Lord, you know them. But Lord, we want to thank you that as we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Lord, so we can stand before you, O oh Lord, with that righteousness that you have given to us that we were thinking about this morning. Thank you so much for that, Lord. And Lord, we just pray, Lord, we've perhaps had quite a, a long day, but we pray, Lord, nevertheless, you would give us the uh, attention and the power, O oh Lord, to hear from you. And Lord, we do pray very much for the work of your Spirit, Father. We, um, we need him to break through. We need a word from heaven, O oh Lord, into our lives, Lord, that wonderful word that comes from your throne, that comes through the scriptures to us by your spirit. Lord, please bless each person here. Lord, you know them. You know all the things that are going through their minds and the things perhaps that are, they're anxious about. But Lord, we do pray that we may be able to turn our anxieties to prayer and indeed to thankfulness, O oh Lord, as we think on who you are. Bless our time, Lord, now. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you've heard this story. A young man, obviously sad, sat on a park bench with his head in his hands, and he looked so miserable that a passing policeman sat down to console him. Something wrong? asked the policeman. You just wouldn't believe it, said the man ruefully. Two months ago, my grandfather died left me a hundred thousand pounds and some shares in his business. Well, that's not so bad, said the policeman. Yes, but that's not the full story, said the sad man. Last month, my uncle died and left me 20,000 pounds. And the policeman raised his eyebrows in bewilderment and said, I don't understand. Why are you so unhappy? And the man responded, so far this month, nothing. <laughs> well, it's a silly story, isn't it? But <laughs> we can be a bit like that if we're not careful. We can uh, write our blessings in the sand and quickly they're washed away and we forget all about them. And we can write our grievances in concrete um, and uh, hold on to them all the time and be unthankful people. And if we're like that, if we're Christians, then something is wrong. Something is wrong with us. We have every reason to be thankful to God. We need to repent and to rethink. And these verses, I think, will be of some help to us, especially verses 16 through to 18. That's what we're looking at. Be joyful always. Pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So we're thinking about this subject of thankfulness. And I'm going to just try and deal with some of this using three questions. Three questions. Our first question is this, how does thankfulness function in the Christian life? How does thankfulness work or should it work in the Christian life? Now there are a few things to clarify here. First, in scripture, thankfulness, what is it? Well, it's the proper reaction to God and his work. It's kind of like our response to what God has done and is doing for us. It's the right response to God, thankfulness. So I don't know, sometime, I can remember some time ago I had some problem, I think, with my leg and the 
physio sat me down on the table and lightly chopped my knee, um, you know, and it's instinctively, it gives a little jerk, doesn't it, if your reflexes are okay. And if your spiritual reflexes are okay, uh, we thank God for all he does. That's our re reflex, that's our response to what God does in our lives. And of course, the other side of that, which is very challenging, is the fact that unthankfulness is the mark of the ungodly and the unsaved. So if you think about Romans chapter 1, where Paul is indicting those who deny God and suppress the truth about him. He says, For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God, nor gave thanks to him. But in their thinking, they became, their thinking became futile. Unthankfulness is the kind of way of those who don't have faith in God, who don't know him. Thankfulness is the proper response to the work of God. So that's the first thing to clarify. Second, in our paragraph, verses 16 through to 18, that little paragraph, it's almost like, it almost should be one verse, shouldn't it? But they, they divide it into three. In that little paragraph, prayer and thankfulness and joy are all part of one package. They all go together. And in fact, the pro most probable reading of the end of verse 18, which says, uh, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus, is not just that we should be thankful, but rather there should be joy and thanks and prayer in all circumstances. Those three should all go together in the different circumstances of our lives. That whole network of joy and prayer and thanks should operate together in our lives. God's will is that this is how his people should live. This joyful, joyful lives that come through continual prayer and, 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 and go together with uh, um, thanksgiving to God for all that he's done. We, we, we've been reconciled. We were thinking this morning about how God has made us righteous in his sight and that cannot be changed as we're believers and, um, and so we should be able to share our lives with God, go through life with God, thanking him, being prayerful and knowing joy as we contemplate that he's at work in our lives. Now of course I know that not all circumstances are immediately joyful but what does the Apostle Paul Tell us, you know these verses. He says this, doesn't he? He says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, there it is, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. So even in the most dire circumstances, which do make us anxious, we can pray and we can thank God for, for, for what he's done in our lives already. And we will know God's peace in that situation. So joy and prayer and thanks work together and feed off one another. That's how it should be. That's how Christians ought to be. Not gloomy, but joyful. Not in a superficial way, but a joy rooted in prayer and thanksgiving to the God who is our God and who knows us. Is that your life? Is that how my life is? That's how the Christian life is meant to be lived. And that's the implication of the words, you see, always, continually, verse, always, verse 16, continually, verse 17, and in eight, verse 18, in all circumstances, you see those three things are kind of parallel to each other, always, continually, in all circumstances. This is how life is meant to be. As the Christian, joy comes from prayerfully and thankfully walking with God. That should be the atmosphere of every church. It should be the aura of every Christian because we have every reason to be thankful and joyful 
because God has made us righteous. God has, not in ourselves, but he's given us this great gift that we were thinking about this morning of justification. Third, other thing to clarify in this opening thing about how does thankfulness function in the Christian life, notice the verbs here are all plural in, that, in those verses. We can take that as either that Paul is addressing every individual, you should be joyful, everybody, or he could be addressing the whole church together as a group, you should be joyful always, praying continually, giving thanks in all circumstances, as a church together perhaps. So we have to ask, well, again, why are so many of us not joyful, not thankful? It's because we have bought into, perhaps, the, what we were thinking about this morning, something that is not the gospel. We've gone back to relying on our own works to some extent, rather than trusting wholly in what Christ has done. Or we've bought into um, a sub-Christian way of living life. We've kind of half gone the way of the world. We think, for example, that joy will come through what we achieve rather than through walking with God. That joy will come through what we have and own rather than walking with God, you see. At least partially. You know, we think it's to do with holidays and houses and, 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 and promotions and all these things. And perhaps we pursue that in quite a fervent way. We stay up late working our socks off to get that promotion. As if through our achievements we, we will reach the pinnacle. And we stay up late and we burn ourselves out and we feel less, less than joyful because there's been no prayer and trusting in God and thanking him for what we have, we've bought into a sub-Christian way of thinking about how joy comes to us. No, real joy comes through knowing the Lord. And we know him through Christ and we can share our lives with him through prayer. And that sharing of our lives should mean that we are thankful for every good thing that we have. So thankfulness is the conscious and right response to the enjoyment of the totality of our relationship with God. God loves us and provides for us. And Lord, it's not what I have, but it's you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's how this Christian life should work. And we can see thankfulness is at the, at the heart of this, this, this combination of joy and prayer and, and thankfulness. That's how to live. That's how it should be in churches. That's how it should be for every Christian. Yes, there are tough times, really tough times but we have a God. We, we fall off the cliff, as we thought this morning, but it's not 300 feet, it's only 20 feet, because we have a God who loves us, who will never give up on us. So there should be a joy about Christian people and about Christian churches. So that's our first little section. We could step back then, and secondly, ask a second question, what are some of the headline reasons as to why the Christian should be thankful? We've mentioned some already, but we're going to mention some more. Because thankfulness is the proper res conscious response to the totality of our relationship with God, what has God done for us? Who is God? What is he doing for us? And of course, because... God himself is infinite. Actually, there are an infinite number of reasons for thankfulness. So to keep within bounds, I've just picked up on a few of the major 
uh, reasons for thankfulness from 1 Thessalonians. Let me just point out a few to you by which we should be giving thanks. Well, first of all, look back in chapter 5 and verse 9. Here's a reason to give thanks. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're just as much sinners as anybody else. We are just as blind as anybody else to the Lord Jesus Christ and our need. But God, for no good in us, nothing to do with us, but God appointed us not to be lost. But he appoint, did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to he appointed us to receive salvation. Wow to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. The beginning of your salvation is not in yourself. It was because God, for reasons that are mysterious and back in eternity and we can never really find the answer to, chose to do us good. Many people like to think of... Um, Salvation, I use, I use this, uh, this analogy quite often. Many people like to think of salvation as a medicine. And I'm ill, and we're all ill with sin, and there's the medicine and it's up to you to take it. That's what they think about salvation. But just imagine that here's a person in hospital who's really ill, terribly ill. They're blind. They're frail. They have dementia. And you say to them, here's the medicine, take it. Is that going to work? Of course it isn't. They don't need just it being offered to them. They need to be treated. They need for the doctor to get hold of them gently, lovingly, <laughs> and treat them. And that's what God has done for you and me. We were blind. We thought completely wrongly. We had, as it were, spiritual dementia. We were in our sins. But God appointed us. God took hold of us. That's where our salvation begins. There is a coming day of judgment. The chaos and trouble we see in our present world at this time Wars and the unravelling of creation, families, even the ideas of, of, of male and female, and all these things that are unravelling and causing all sorts of difficulties. These things are just um, breaking down, and, and these are warnings of the coming day of wrath. That's how the book of Revelation, was. they're kind of trumpet calls to say, wake up, can you see what happens to the world when you exclude God? Can't you see this? It's in the obvious, it's in front of your eyes, what's happening in our society now? There are trumpet calls from God to say, look, wake up, you need me. And God has woken us up. And obviously he sent his son to die, to atone for our sins, to live that righteous life that was counted to us. He has brought us to repentance and faith and forgiven and saved us from that dreadful coming day of wrath. And he does that and he continues to do it even though as Christians we're not far from perfect. We continue to mess up. Remember the Apostle Paul, a wretched man that I am. He's an apostle. So he, he knows his own weaknesses and sins. A wretched man that I am. Thank, who will deliver me? But thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. So there's the big reason for thankfulness. God's salvation. And let's just push on with this a little bit. The second reason for Thankfulness is God's spirit. If you look back to chapter 2, sorry, chapter 1 uh, of Thessalonians, verses, verses 2, and then, see, we thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers, 
Verse 4, for we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. That's what I've just been speaking about. Because our gospel came to you not simply with words, but also with power, with the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. You now, And then it goes on, we know how we lived among you. But you, the gospel came to you with, with power, with the Holy Spirit, and in deep conviction. How was it we came to faith? We were convicted of our sins. By the Holy Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, we were blind, as we've said, in our sin. Blind to Judgment Day, blind to the cross, blind to how much God loved us. But the Spirit took off the blindfold. I suddenly knew that the preacher's words were true. This wasn't just something that goes on. This was true for me. It was true. Not just for me. True. Thank the Lord. And now God's Spirit lives in us. So that even if we stray, he keeps bringing us back to the way. I've been reborn and, and I'm on my way to heaven. We thank God that the Spirit of God is at work within us. And Paul himself is rejoicing because of the Spirit's work. This is what we read in 1 Thessalonians. The Spirit's work in Achaia. That's in part of Greece. Not just a few people, but a wonderful church. Look at chapter 1 again, verse 6. You became imitators of us. You followed us as we followed the Lord Jesus and of the Lord. In spite of severe suffering, you welcomed the message with joy given by the Holy Spirit. And so you became a model to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. The Lord's message rang out from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, your faith in God has come, become known everywhere. So this church grew up, a church from which the gospel sounded out. No doubt you have some churches in, in Eastbourne that sound their bell sometimes. Uh, yeah. And that's what was happening, but it wasn't just the ringing of bells that were sounding out, it was the gospel that was sounding out from this church and influencing the whole region by the power of the Spirit. That's what the Spirit had done. And then if you read through the book of Acts, you, you think to yourself, well, how long did it take for the, for the Lord to build that church? How long did it take for the Spirit to, to do that work? And the answer is astonishing. Paul was in Thessalonica just three Sabbath days, just three weeks. You can read about that in Acts 17. Well, how did it happen then? How, how could such a church like that be raised up in three weeks? By the power of God's Spirit. That Spirit is in you, and he's in the churches, and he's building Christ's kingdom. And that's what's happening all over the world. And yes, we may be going through difficult times in our country at the moment, but still Christ's kingdom is expanding, is growing. Thank God that his promises are coming true. That's a big thing, isn't it, to, to think about. It's worth thinking, isn't it? Um, about the growth of the church in China in the last 70 years. Growth of the church in India, someone was mentioning about the persecution. South America, in our own lifetime, many of us, the church has grown in astonishing ways. The Bible says the Lord will call people from every language, tribe and tongue. Think about China. I think when the missionaries were chucked out in 1949, there were probably just about half a million Christians there. And then there was Chairman Mao, and there was the Cultural Revolution, and there was persecution. And surely that was going to mean that the church would die out. But oh no, we know this, don't we? Instead, the church, now in China numbers... 60 million, 100 million, perhaps more people. The church has actually grown. How does that happen when there's persecution? Well, it's the power of the Spirit. We thank God 
for the power of his spirit. So we thank God for his salvation, we thank God for his spirit. We can also thank God for his sovereignty. As we've said about um, the church in Thessalonica, almost immediately the church began to grow. Persecution broke out in, in Thessalonica against the new church. Paul had to run for his life. That's why he was only there for three Sabbath days. Would the church stand under such pressure? Look back at chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. Brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing we made every effort to see you, for we wanted to come to you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. So Paul takes action. Chapter 3, verse 1, So when we could stand it no longer, we thought it best to be left by ourselves in Athens. We sent Timothy, who is our brother and God's fellow worker in spreading the gospel of Christ to strengthen and encourage your faith. And as Paul writes the letter, chapter 3, verse 6, see it there? But Timothy has just now come to us from you and has brought good news about your faith and love. He has told us that you always have pleasant memories of us and that you long to see us just as we long to see you. Their faith has stood. God is sovereign. Can he keep his people and grow his kingdom despite persecution? Yes, he can. Thank you, Lord. He will hold me fast. Give thanks in all circumstances, Paul is saying to us. You think, here's the reason. God's salvation, God's spirit, God's sovereign power, through his spirit, if you like, to keep us and keep us in the faith. Thank you, Lord. And of course, we can also thank God for his people, for his saints. Back to chapter 1, verse 2, what did we read there? Paul writing to them, we always thank God for all of you, mentioning you in our prayers. We continually remember for before our God and Father, your work produced by faith, your labour prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a blunt question. In the church, do you just take one another for granted? Or do you look at each other and say, thank God. Thank God for that person's salvation. Thank God for that person's gift. Thank God for the way she does this in the church. These are God's saints that God has gifted you are God's people. Do you give thanks for each other? Paul gave thanks for them, didn't he? In the church, I give thanks for you. Do you give thanks for each other? And Paul did more than just give thanks, didn't he? He tells them, I thank God for you. Ever done that to each other? I thank God for you. I thank God for you in the church. That's how a church ought to be, you see. That's, that's to encourage one another. It's the great role, particularly, of pastors and elders to encourage, but we should all encourage one another by thanking God for each other when we pray on our own, but thanking God and saying thank you f to each other for what God has done through you. Of course, it's right to give that God thanks for our food, for our health and every blessing, but there are even bigger things than that. Our salvation, God's spirit, God's sovereignty, God's saints. Sometimes it's not easy to be thankful. Things have gone wrong. People have hurt you. But go back always to those big headline reasons for thankfulness. Yes, that person rubbed me up the wrong way. Yes, that person trod tr on my toes. But I'm not going to let that spoil my day or even 
define my life. I'm going to go back to God's salvation. Go back to his spirit that brought me to faith, his sovereignty that keeps me. And I'm going to thank God for these things, to thank God I'm saved, to thank God the coming of Christ and his kingdom is unstoppable. Get that perspective. Stop thinking like the world. But rethink. So those are some of the headline reasons for thankfulness. And why is thankfulness so important? Well, let's go back to our verses. Here they are in chapter 5, verses 16 to 18. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Why is this attitude of gratitude so vital in our lives? We've already had a general clue. If thankfulness is the proper conscious response to God, then we can't live the Christian life properly as it should be lived without that note of thankfulness continually being sounded in our hearts. Thankfulness is the big indicator that you have a healthy Christian life, that you're walking with God and responding to him. We can see that, can't we? That's, that, that's the general reason why uh, thankfulness is so important. But let's get a bit more specific, shall we? Why is thankfulness so important to us as individuals? First of all, because it will help you see the world in perspective. It will help you as an individual to be at peace. It will also, of course, make our relationships with others much better. When people know that we are thankful people, and we're not trying, you know, we're thankful, we're thankful in ourselves because of God, and we're not trying to get at them or anything like that because our life is complete in the Lord Jesus Christ, then our relationships with others are so much easier. Living like the world brings rivalry and, 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 and bitterness in relation, leads to competition and envy and all that. Kind. That's not the way the church should be. That's not the way I need to be as an individual. Look at verses 12 and 13 of our chapter. Now we ask you, brothers to respect those who work hard among you, who are over you in the Lord and who admonish you. That's the elders and, and the pastor. Respect them. As I travel around the churches, very often I don't hear much respect for leaders. People are more, much more ready to tell me what's wrong with their pastor <laughs> than to, to give thanks for him. Paul's aware of that kind of thing. So he's saying to respect those who work hard for you. Hold them in the highest regard, in love, because of their work. Well, how can you do that? Well, if you're thankful, you're a thankful person. You're thankful what, for what God has done in our lives. And you thank God that he's given us these leaders. You know, they're not perfect. They do make mistakes, but they are doing their best. Lord, thank you for these people. There's a respect there, you see. Yeah, work makes the church much more what it should be. And of course, verse, let's look at verses 14 and 15. And we urge you, brothers, and I think now he's talking to the elders and pastor in particular at this point. Warn those who are idle, encourage the timid, help the weak, be patient with everyone. How can an elder be patient? with difficult people in the church. When he has a thankful relationship, a joyful, prayerful relationship with God, it will enable him to have the strength to be patient with people. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always try to be kind to each other. Kindness among the leadership in the church. Kindness from the leadership to the church, kindness among the members 
of the church. Where does that come from? From walking with God joyfully, thankfully, prayerfully. You can see how important this is. So let me press this a bit more. Why is this thankfulness so important for the church? Well, look at the following verses, the ones just after verses 16 to 18. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. If there's one way to put out the Spirit's fire and stifle the work of God among us, it's unthankfulness. Lack of thankfulness. If we're not thankful for what God has done, why should he do more? Fair question. That attitude of gratitude is missing. And it grieves the Spirit. God has given you his Son. He has given you eternal life. He's given you that righteousness. He's given you that eternal salvation. And my uncle died and left me a thousand pounds or whatever it was and nothing this month. <laughs> Remember the story at the beginning? We're like that. So would you see the Lord much more at work among you? Well, be thankful then. Be thankful people, prayerful people, joyful people. So we have seen how thankfulness, sparking prayer and joy in God is how the Christian life is meant to be lived. We have seen that some of the major factors to thank God for are his salvation, his spirit, his sovereignty, his saints, and we have seen how thankfulness, as it were, lubricates and enhances our relationships and acts as a bellows <laughs> to fan into flame the Spirit's work in a church. We still at home have an old log-burning fire, and sometimes I have to get down on my knees and blow on the embers to, uh, to make the flames come afresh. Well, how do you blow on the embers of the church for the flames of the Spirit to, to jump up again? Well, thankfulness and prayerfulness, of course. That's, that's what we should be doing. Do you get the message? I think a message that perhaps the Lord wants this church to hear. Thankfulness. Amen.